Welcome to this short series on the five devotional writers from the 14th century, which together have come to be known as the English mystics. My name is Emma Pennington and I'm a canon here at Canterbury Cathedral. In the following five videos, one devoted to each writer, I invite you to explore with me these remarkable people who they were, what they wrote, and how over six centuries later they still speak to us today. It was not until 1934 that Marjorie Kemp came to be included as one of the English mystics when the Middle English scholar Hope Emily Allen discovered the lost book of Marjorie Kemp in the library of Lieutenant Colonel Butler Bowden. Now it rests in the British Library and is the only copy we have which tells of the extraordinary devotional life of this late middle-aged lady from King's Lynn. From visions to tears, pilgrimage to heresy trials, her text gives us a wonderful window into that world and the spiritual life of this lady who defied the authorities and turned hearts to God. Unlike Julian of Norwich, Marjorie leaves us a great deal of information about herself and her life. Hers is spirituality not of the mind and thought but of everyday incarnational interaction with people and lived out devotion. She is steeped in the devotional life of the late 14th century with its practices of pilgrimage, prayer, fasting, feasts and penance. So much so that it feels as if through her text we step back into that world which for us can be most strange and yet also beguiling. The book of Marjorie Kemp has been described as the first autobiography in English, or perhaps we should say spiritual autobiography, for it moves from facts about Marjorie's life into her spiritual devotional life in one seamless movement. Here we learn that Marjorie was born in the prosperous port of Kings Lynn in 1373 and records in the Guild of the Trinity state that she is still alive in 1438. She tells us she was married when she was just 20 and had her first child around 1394. This was a traumatic event for her and convinced that she was going to die, Marjorie called for her confessor. But she was unable to confess a particular sin that was on her conscience. The fear of damnation as a result drove her to a state of insanity that lasted eight months. Recovery came from her first vision when Christ, robed in purple, came and sat on her bed and asked her a single question. Daughter, why have you forsaken me and I never forsook you? Marjorie describes him slowly ascending into heaven, leaving her restored to her wits. But her first visionary experience didn't lead her to a spiritual conversion. Instead, Marjorie tells us how she hungered for wealth and status and set up two businesses in Lynn, one a brewery and the other a mill. They prospered for two to four years until everything started to go wrong. 
It was then that she had her second intense experience. One night, as she lay in bed, Marjorie heard the sound of what she calls heavenly music. She jumped up and exclaimed, Alas, that ever I sinned, it is full merry in heaven. Thereafter, any music or celebration brought on uncontrollable sobbing. So began what can only be called an intense life of prayer, penance and pilgrimage, which was unconventional even for the late 14th century. She spent hours in church sobbing and weeping, attended confession frequently, and once she had persuaded her husband to allow her to take a vow of celibacy, she entered the life of a permanent pilgrim, traveling the length and breadth of England for spiritual advice and guidance on her many visions of conversations with Christ. She even went to Julian of Norwich to ask whether she could advise her on the authenticity of her revelations. So was Marjorie constantly dogged by self-doubt and anxiety over her visions and her dreams. And for good reason, as her unusual spiritual practices and disruptive behaviour often brought her into conflict with those around her and even the church authorities, as is typified by her encounter with the monks of Christ Church Priory here at Canterbury Cathedral. On one occasion, when this creature was at Canterbury in the church amongst the monks, she was greatly despised and reproved because she wept so much both by the monks and the priests and by secular men, nearly all day, both morning and afternoon. And so much so that her husband went away from her as if he had not known her and left her alone among them. Choose how she might, for no further comfort did she have from him that day. So an old monk, who had been treasurer to the queen when he was in secular clothes, a powerful man and greatly feared by many people, took her by the hand, saying to her, What can you say of God? Sir, she said, I will both speak of him and hear of him, repeating to the monk a story from scripture. The monk said, I wish you were enclosed in a house of stone, so that no one should speak with you. Ah, sir, she said, you should support God's servants, and you are the first that hold against them. Our Lord amend you. Then a young monk said to the creature, Either you have the Holy Ghost, or else you have a devil within you. For what you are speaking here to us is holy writ, and that you do not have of yourself. Then this creature said, I pray you, sir, give me leave to tell you a tale. Then people said to the monk, Let her say what she wants. And then she said, there was once a man who had sinned greatly against God, and when he was shriven, his confessor enjoined him as part of his penance that he should for one year hire men to chide him and reprove him for his sins, and he should give them silver for their labour. And one day he came amongst many great men, such as are here now, God save you all, and stood among them as I now stand amongst you they despising him as you do me. The man all the while laughing and smiling and having good sport at their words. The chief among them said to the man, why are you laughing you wretch when you are being greatly despised? Ah sir, I have great cause to laugh because I have for many days been taking silver from my purse and hiring men to chide me for remission of my sin. And today I can keep my silver in my purse. I thank you all. Right so I say to you, worshipful sirs, 
while I was at home in my own part of the country, day by day with great weeping and mourning, I sorrowed because I did not have any of the shame, scorn and contempt that I deserved. I thank you highly, sirs, for what morning and afternoon I have received today in rightful measure. Blessed be God for it. Then she went out of the monastery, they following and crying upon her, You shall be burnt, you false lollard. Here is a cartful of thorns ready for you, and a barrel to burn you with. The creature stood outside the gates of Canterbury, for it was the evening, with many people wondering at her. Marjorie is perhaps best known for her excessive weeping and screaming even, which was brought about by her intense sense of repentance, not only for her own sins, but for the sins of the whole world, as well as for compassion in the sufferings of Christ. Her conspicuous wailing brought her in for much criticism in our day as well as in her own but it also brought others to God. When Marjorie was in the church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome on one of her great pilgrimages abroad she tells of a vision she had there in which Saint Jerome himself affirms her ministry of tears. Blessed are you, daughter, in the weeping that you do for people's sins, for through them many shall be saved. And many were. Some even asked Marjorie to weep for them on their deathbed. In many ways, the book of Marjorie Kemp written down by priests and scribes and compiled from Marjorie's dictation is not so much a book, it's as much a book to justify and explain her unconventional devotional life as it is to tell us about her spiritual experiences and revelations. But in this narrative of an extraordinary lady from Lynn, we see someone who had an uncompromising attitude to living their faith, an audacity which challenged the religious authorities of her day, and yet was shaken by self-doubt, and whose life of prayer was never simple or easy. Whatever you think of Marjorie the person, her way of life and text unsettles us today as much as it did those around her in the 14th century. As she confronts us with how radical and uncompromising the gospel message really is and what it means to be united in heart, mind and body with the person of Christ. Next time we come to the fifth and final part in our English Mystic series as we plunge into the cloud of unknowing and ponder who could have written this enigmatic and influential little text which still speaks to us so powerfully today. Thank you very much for watching.